In this video, I'm going to be discussing my experience with the KonMari method, both past and present, everything I learned from it, what I think I got wrong the first time, how my life has changed because of doing it, and also some new things that I've taken away from rereading The Life-Changing Magic of Tidying Up and reading Spark Joy for the first time. And also some things about the method that I don't personally love that don't work for me. This is going to be the first video in a series where I'm going to be going back through the KonMari method, doing it again, and hopefully doing it better this time, both in terms of following the method more closely and also just doing it in a way that works better for me personally. I'll also be throwing in some of my own methods and tips that I've used in the years since konmari my life to keep my life much more tidy than it was before. Almost exactly four years ago was when I first discovered the method and started implementing it in my life and made an entire video series on this channel dedicated to decluttering my items. Since then my life has changed a lot both in relation to the method and completely separate from it. I've lost 30 pounds. I've moved four times, I think. I finished my master's degree. I started my first professional job. And also I've started running a K-pop YouTube channel that now is my side hustle. I hate using that term, but that's what it is. I've also embraced in my own personal way minimalism. I've still got a ways to go. It's definitely a journey, but I'm not the pack rat that I used to be and my space is not the untidy mess that it used to be either. I've also actually done the KonMari method again in small doses a couple other times. It's always a nice reset and I feel like I need to do something like that like maybe once every year. I've also been attempting to implement it in my digital space to much lesser success, mostly because it's just a huge slog to go through terabytes and terabytes of files that you've accumulated over like 15 years. If you want to know how I've been doing that, let me know. I might add an extra video onto this series, but fair warning, it's a slog. So the KonMari method has genuinely changed my life for the better. Maybe not immediately that first time I did the full declutter, but in the smaller ones since then and in the years since then, it's just continued to snowball and improve my life. Because most importantly, it's changed the way I view my belongings and the relationship that I have with them. I really realized how much having a cluttered, chaotic living space can present itself in my mental state as well, and how much calmer I feel overall and in general when I'm living in a much more tidy environment. Lately, I've been feeling a bit bogged down, a bit in a rut. It tends to happen around this time every year, and when I feel like that, I know that I need to simplify, I need to reevaluate, and that often goes hand in hand with decluttering for me. I also recently read Essentialism by Greg McCune, and there were some concepts that he introduced in there that I felt really meshed well with the KonMari method. And I want to try to implement some of the things that were mentioned in Essentialism as I'm doing the KonMari method this time, because I think that they will help me with my constant problem with the method, which is the concept of what does sparking joy even mean? Before we jump into the method, as with any method or like self-help advice, take what works for you, what resonates with you, and leave the rest. If you want to try and do the method to a T, go for it, have at it. But if you find that there are things that don't resonate with you, don't work for you, you don't have to do them. No pre-established method or rules are going to work perfectly for every single person. It's about realizing what works for you and what doesn't. And like I said, I am going to be talking in this video about some of the things about the method that just don't work for me. As I mentioned in the intro, I did recently read Spark Joy for the first time and I'm going to be discussing it throughout, but one thing I wanted to mention near the beginning of this video is that I read it all in one fell swoop and I don't think that's the best way to use that book. The first half of the book has some really useful clarifications on her first book, if that's something that you think will be useful to you, but the largest chunk of the book is actually much better used as a reference for organization rather than reading it all in one fell swoop. I checked it out from the library. I still haven't decided if I'm going to buy my own copy because I found a lot of the stuff in the first half of the book that clarified life-changing magic. I found a lot of that to be useful, but a lot of the organization felt like it was a bit too specific for it to be useful to me personally. We'll see as I go through the method. Okay, very quick oversimplified explanation of the KonMari method if you're not familiar with it. The core of it is that there are two steps, discarding and organization. You do them separately and you do them by category, not by location in your home. The basis of your decision making is to focus on what sparks joy and keep that 
rather than focusing on what you want to get rid of. And right off the bat, firstly, this is something that I think I didn't totally nail the first time through. I did and still really struggle with the concept of what sparking joy really feels like. The biggest thing about the KonMari method in general that I don't vibe with is a lot of the mysticism or spiritual elements such as items having energy, talking to your items, treating them as anything other than inanimate objects, which is to me what they are. And the idea of sparking joy has kind of always fallen under that umbrella because it's basically just having a strong emotional response to just holding an item which is something I don't personally feel. And because I did struggle with the concept of sparking joy, I think I did end up focusing more on what to get rid of than what to keep and what sparked joy or made me happy because it was an ambiguous concept. However, in the book Spark Joy, she actually does give some suggestions that are much more tangible ideas to help you figure out what sparks joy. She suggests that for any given category, you start by picking your three favorite items or the three items that most spark joy for you. And you use these three items as the basis for what sparking joy means to you. She also suggests that you could even go from there and just rank every other item until you hit a point where the items no longer spark joy to you. Again, Sparking joy is an ambiguous concept, but I feel like this is a much more concrete way to go about it rather than just holding items. And it's something that makes a lot of sense to my brain because picking a top three is something that I feel like I can do fairly easily and rankings are something that my brain really enjoys. So this is definitely something I'm going to try to incorporate into the KonMari method this time. This is also where some of these suggestions from essentialism come in because they were centered around making choices. He had two suggestions for making choices that I think will be helpful when I'm torn about what to do. First is the rule of 90%, where if you don't give something at least 90% out of 100, it's a zero. Get rid of it. Don't take the opportunity. Don't keep the item. So if the criteria is does it spark joy and you're only like 70% sure it does, maybe that's not enough joy to keep it. The other method he presents does deviate a bit more from the concept of sparking joy, but I think it'll be especially useful to people like me who struggle with that concept. For this, write down a list of three minimum criteria for keeping something and three ideal criteria for something. For shirts, the minimum criteria could be something like it fits, I like the design, and I have actually worn this item. Ideal criteria could be something like I bring it on a trip with me, I think I'll still like this in five years, and I would wear this to impress someone. Any item that doesn't meet your minimum requirements should be discarded, but if an item doesn't also meet two of your three ideal requirements, you should also discard it. Like I said, it deviates from the concept of sparking joy, but I think that if you pick the right requirements, it can mimic that for you. For example, if you focus on how you feel in the shirt, like one of the requirements being, this makes me feel confident, stuff along those lines, I feel like it can definitely mimic sparking joy, but in a more concrete way that might make sense to people who are really analytical. Moving on to another thing I did wrong the first time, I broke one of the cardinal rules. I watched America's Next Top Model while decluttering. She says ideally you shouldn't even be listening to music in order to better communicate with your items. Again, anything she says about communicating with items or talking to them doesn't resonate with me, so I think this is why I ignored it the first time around. But I do think that distractions can cloud your decision making, so this time I am going to declutter without anything on in the background. This will be interesting as I really struggle with being present in the moment because I literally always have something on in the background. The next thing I didn't do correctly was to visualize my destination. She suggests that before you start decluttering, you should visualize what your ideal life would be. I didn't do this on purpose. I read the book in one fell swoop and once I was done with it, a couple days later, I started decluttering using the techniques. I just didn't remember to go back and look before and see that I should have done that visualization thing. I've seen advice like this reiterated in many other places and I think it's something that's really important so I will definitely be doing it this time around. I also enjoy thinking about things like this but I'm not very good at doing it because the future is so up in the air but I'm gonna try. In Spark Joy she adds to this by suggesting that you should find a single photograph upon which you can imagine your ideal lifestyle. She says since it's difficult to imagine the lifestyle you want, if you can find one picture that will 
embody that for you, it'll really help make it more concrete. Fortunately for me, I have an entire Pinterest board of pictures like this. Unfortunately for me, I have an entire Pinterest board of pictures like this because none of them is exactly perfect. Some feel a bit too cold, others a bit too cluttered, some are close but just not quite right, so I'll keep looking for the perfect one, but I never find the perfect one, so it'll probably be something from that last group of close but not quite. The next guideline I could follow a little bit better is to not scatter storage spaces. I have unintentionally not really kept items of the same type together and that's something I want to do better this time around. She also talks a lot about using built-in furniture before using your own furniture that is for storage because she wants you to operate on the idea that you will probably get rid of some sort of storage furniture. Obviously, I'm not doing this for the first time, so I don't have the same excess of items that a lot of people do when they do it the first time. And as such, I really don't see any storage items in my home that I would be able to get rid of. Pretty much all of them serve another purpose for me other than just storage. My dresser has my TV on it. One of my desks doesn't have any storage at all, so I have a set of drawers next to it. I have a section of card catalog that's a sentimental item. Just none of these things are things I could see myself discarding because they serve more than one purpose. That said, I know for a fact that I'm not utilizing my closet to its fullest potential, so that's something I want to improve. All right, I've talked about what I want to do better, now let's jump into my favorite major and minor things about the KonMari method. My favorite major thing about the method is tidying by category rather than location. This is by far the best thing about the method. It solves so many problems. Firstly, it points out how many duplicate items you have. One of my favorite examples of this is the first time through I was going through my pens and I discovered I had like 15 green pens and five of them were this like really gross yellow green color. Firstly, green's one of my least favorite colors, and secondly, like a yellow green is possibly my least favorite color ever, and I had all these pens that were that color. Also, tidying by category makes comparisons so much easier. When going through all of your shirts at the same time, it's a lot easier to figure out which ones spark joy and which ones don't than if you were to go through your closet on one day and then your dresser on a different day. And then my favorite smaller aspect of the method is one that I've mentioned several times, and it's folding things and storing them vertically. I've been storing my shirts vertically since at least two or three years before I even did the KonMari method. It's the superior way to store clothing because you can see everything instead of just piling it on top of each other. I do fold differently from her because I want to make sure the logos on my shirts are visible, but either way, it optimizes storage space and it makes things more visible. It's great. I don't have any tea handy. I haven't even made any coffee, but it is now time to spill the tea and talk about the things that I don't like about the method. Please remember, this is just me personally. If you like these things, that's great. Keep doing them. I just disagree with her on some points. Let's start with books, as this is a book channel after all, and my background is breaking several of her rules. One of the quotes in Spark Joy that actually just sparked anger in me was the following. As for books you've read halfway or not at all, get rid of the whole lot. She stresses many times in both books that you can't tidy for someone else because you don't know what sparks joy for them. However, she also has several quotes like this that just say, get rid of all of this category that make it seem like she's trying to tell you what should spark joy to you. Maybe this is what she prefers, but it's advice that I don't think works for a lot of book lovers. She also largely talks about books as information, so I wonder if she's even taking fiction into consideration when talking about books or if she's just thinking about nonfiction, because that's my assumption. Furthermore, she often talks as if she just assumes people don't reread books, which definitely isn't the case for me and I know isn't the case for a lot of other people too. Sure, I've not reread every single book that I own, but I've reread a non-insignificant portion of them. In fact, I would go out on a limb and say I have reread the majority of books you see behind me right now. Now, having said that, I feel familiar enough with her philosophy on decluttering after watching her show and reading these books that I feel like if she was your actual consultant in person and came and helped you tidy, she would probably say that if these unread books spark joy for you, you should keep them. Maybe not 100% would she say that, but I think that she would say that. I think in her books, she tends to word some of her own personal opinions and some of her suggestions a lot more firmly 
then she would ask you to implement them if she talked to you in person. Not all of her opinions are law, and especially not when she says that you should get rid of an entire category of an item like all of your unread books. The other thing about books that she says that just doesn't make any sense to me, I'm gonna read the quote because as a full statement, it doesn't make any sense to me. The most common reason people cannot discard books is because they might want to reread them, but if they don't spark joy now, you definitely won't reread it some other day. I agree that if you didn't like it the first time you read it and it didn't spark joy, you probably won't want to reread it later. But if I have a book that I might want to reread in the future, it's probably because it did spark joy the first time I read it. If it didn't spark joy the first time, if I didn't like the book, I probably wouldn't even be considering rereading it. I just think the way that statement is worded is weird and is there to just encourage you to discard books you've already read, but she also wants you to discard books you haven't read. I think she just doesn't want you to own that many books. <laughs> Which again ties back into she personally doesn't like owning many books, so I think she's a bit harsher on books than a lot of people would be, especially people like me who are book lovers. So I think when she makes these big, bold, definitive statements like this, just use it if it works for you, don't use it if it doesn't. She also has a section called Storing Books Attractively where she suggests that you store your books on shelves in the closet. Not gonna happen. She also has this weird section that she's titled Becoming the Person That Matches the Books You Keep. She says that when you finish tidying your books, to take a step back and look at what words and titles jump out to you. In a way, I think this could be a cool way to assess yourself based on the type of books you keep. For example, if I were to keep all of my writing craft books and discard all of my music books, that might make me realize, oh hey, maybe the music thing isn't that important to me anymore. But she presents this more in the way that if negative words jump off the spine to you and you see the negative words, you're like inviting negativity into your life. When I wrote my notes for this section, I looked over at my bookcase and the first book that jumped out to me is titled Grotesque. So I think that tells you all that needs to be said about how I feel about that piece of advice, because honestly, a lot of these books around here have death as a prominent feature and just, uh, sorry. One interesting thing she doesn't talk about very much in the method is the idea of a specific lifestyle sparking joy versus items. For example, I'm not sure all of my towels spark joy, but what does spark joy is not having to do laundry very often, so I have a lot of towels. Similarly, there's a point in Spark Joy when she has a client who has a lot of plastic silverware, disposable stuff like that, and she asks her, does this really spark joy for you? And my response to that is it's probably not about those disposable things sparking joy, but rather that uh, doing the dishes doesn't spark joy. Personally, it's my least favorite household chore I put it off as long as possible. Thankfully, I now have a dishwasher, so that makes my life a lot easier and I don't use disposable items that often. But if I didn't have the dishwasher, I think I'd much rather be spending my time doing things I enjoy than washing dishes. So therefore, the trade-off of using a paper plate and disposable silverware is something I'm very willing to make and sparks quite a bit more joy than doing dishes. So it's just interesting that she has you do this visualization of your ideal lifestyle, but otherwise she doesn't really focus on lifestyle, just on items, even though sometimes items that might not spark as much joy on their own do spark joy as a better lifestyle, if that makes sense. It's just interesting and something I think I'm gonna try to look at going forward. Another suggestion that doesn't totally make sense to me is that she says not to organize by flow of use, but to have one storage area. She talks about how the difficult part of keeping your home tidy is putting things away, not getting things out. So you should store things where they're easy to put away, not easy to get out. Because when you get something out, you have a purpose for doing so other than just I need to get it out. But this is why I think that organizing by flow of use is useful because if I'm sitting at my desk and I can reach over into a drawer and grab a pen in two seconds, it also takes me only two seconds to put that pen back away in the drawer. Whereas if I had all of my pens across the room, sure, if I needed a pen, I would go up and get it because I need a pen, but that would add the friction of having to get up again to go put it away. That's why I think flow of use makes sense. She literally says, put it somewhere where it's easy to put away, not necessarily where it's easy to take out, but that is literally what flow of use is. 
It's putting it somewhere where it's easy to put it back away, AKA exactly where you're at and using it. Maybe this is different for different people, but I just think she contradicts herself in that point. If I need to use something somewhere and it's easy to take out, it's also easy to put it away in the same spot. Another piece of advice that just doesn't work for me is she says you should empty your bag every night. This one works on the assumption that you use different bags on different days. So therefore you should take everything out of your bag at night so you don't forget anything in the morning and you can put it all back in a new bag. I take the same bag to work every single day. If I took everything out at night, I would 100% forget something at some point in the week and it would be a nightmare. And it would definitely be my ibuprofen on a day when I have a headache. That's why I don't take anything out of my bag. That's another one just doesn't work for me. All right, enough complaining about the method. We're about to get closer to the wrap up here. Now I wanna talk about what I want to improve about this series this time around. It's basically one big thing. I wanna show myself actually decluttering more. I think the first time because I didn't want to do time lapses, I just ended up not recording myself decluttering at all. And while I still definitely don't want to do time lapses, I think there are ways to incorporate filming while I am decluttering. Showing you my like three spark joy items from each category or talking through my thought process or talking about what's not working. Stuff like that. I want to make sure I talk about that more this time through this video series than I did the first time. All right, so I want to end with a few quotes from Spark Joy that I think really embody what I want to get out of this process this time through. The first quote, while some items we assume don't spark joy actually do, Sometimes the lack of that spark represents our own inner voice. This quote was in relation to a lot of her clients who discovered that their work outfits, none of them sparked joy. And they realized that it was more because the job didn't spark joy than the clothes themselves. For me, I'm not thinking of this in terms of work clothes, but I'm interested to see if there's a category that does this for me. Like I wanna see if there's any information that can be gleaned based on what does and doesn't spark joy for me this time through the method. And finally, Tidying up is more than deciding what to keep and what to discard. Rather, it's a priceless opportunity for learning, one that allows you to reassess and fine tune your relationship with your possessions and to create the lifestyle that brings you the most joy. This just really sums up what I want to get out of this time through the KonMari method. I've already decluttered a few times. I don't own the mounds and mounds of stuff that you see on her show or that she deals with from clients or even that I had the first time through. This time it's really just all about decluttering my mind through decluttering my belongings. Like I said earlier in the video, I've been feeling pretty bogged down lately and I really just hope that this will help add a sense of clarity that I feel like I've been missing lately. So that's my discussion on the KonMari method before I go back through it. I'm very excited to do this declutter. I, I just I feel like I need it and I feel like it'll help and I'm just, I'm ready. As always, links to my social media are down in the description, especially Goodreads and Twitter. That's where I'm most active. Please add me as a friend on Goodreads. I'd love to be friends with all of you on there. Like, comment, subscribe, all that jazz. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.